But first, let's review some concepts from before. We say that a permutation of a set A is a bimorphism, that is a bijection sigma, from the set A to itself. We have the following main results. Given a set A, let S sub A denote the collection of permutations sigma. The identity map, which sends lowercase a to itself, is an example of a permutation. If sigma and tau are two permutations, then their composition sigma circle tau is also a permutation. Moreover, the inverse of sigma circle tau is tau inverse circle sigma inverse. With circle as the composition map, the pair S sub A along with circle is a group. If A is a finite set consisting of n elements, namely lowercase a sub 1, lowercase a sub 2, through lowercase a sub n, then S sub A has n factorial elements. We give a few definitions. Say that A is a non-empty set, and let S sub A denote the set of all permutations sigma from A to itself. The pair S sub A, along with composition circle, is called the symmetric group on A. In particular, when A simply consists of the integers 1, 2, through n, its symmetric group is simply denoted by S sub n and is called the symmetric group of degree n. We'll use this now to motivate the concept of group actions. Here's the definition. Let the pair G, along with an operation circle, be a group with identity E. A group action by G on a set A is a well-defined map, which we will also denote by circle, from G cross A to A, which we write as sending the pair lowercase g, comma, lowercase a, to the element lowercase g circle lowercase a, which satisfies the following two axioms. The first we call associativity. For all elements lowercase g sub 1 and g sub 2 in our group capital G, and elements lowercase a in our set capital A, we have g sub 1 circle parentheses g sub 2 circle A is equal to parentheses g sub 1 circle g sub 2 circle A. The first axiom here allows us to unambiguously define g1 circle g2 circle A. Notice that g sub 2 circle A is an element in capital A, where here we're focusing on the action of capital G on capital A. The second, namely g sub 1 circle g sub 2, is just an element of the group capital G. Our second of two axioms, we call identity, states for each element lowercase a in our set capital A, we have E circle A equals A. Recall here that E is the identity of our group capital G. Sometimes we'll say that this is a left group action of capital G on capital A. We have the following main result. Say that G, along with a binary operation circle, is a group acting on a set A. For each element lowercase g and capital G, the map, which will denote by sigma sub lowercase g, which sends A to itself, which is defined by A going to G circle A, is an example of a permutation. Here, once again, we fix our element lowercase g, and we map lowercase a to the element G circle lowercase a. The map phi, which sends our group G to the set of permutations S sub A, defined by sending an element lowercase g to the permutation sigma sub lowercase g, is an example of a group homomorphism. Recall here that we think of G as a group under our operation circle, and S sub A is a group under composition, which we also denote by circle. Here's the definition. The map phi, which goes from our group G to our permutations S sub A, defined by sending an element lowercase g to the permutation sigma sub G, is called the permutation representation of the associated action on capital A. If the kernel of this group homomorphism is trivial, then we say that G acts faithfully on our set A. In this case, we may view G as a subgroup of the set of permutations S sub A. We'll focus on this in quite a bit of detail today. Here's an example that you probably have seen from linear algebra, 
but didn't quite think of it in this way. Consider a set capital A, which is just the vector space of dimension n over either the real numbers or the complex numbers. That is, capital A will consist of the collection of n-dimensional vectors x, which just consists of the coordinates x sub 1, x sub 2, through x sub n. Recall that the general linear group GLN of f is a group under multiplication. Here, GLN of f just consists of those n by n matrices, which we'll denote by capital A, whose entries, namely lowercase a sub ij, lie inside of f, and the determinant is not equal to zero. These are just the invertible n by n matrices that have entries in f. There is an action of our group G, recall GLN, on the set A, recall the n-dimensional vector space. Here, it's just given by left multiplication by matrices. That is, if we're given an invertible matrix capital A and a vector X, then the action here is just multiplying the matrix A by the vector X. Recall that if we multiply an n by n matrix A by an n-dimensional vector X, we will return an n-dimensional vector a times x. Here are a few remarks. We note that this is actually a left group action. Indeed, by the associativity of matrix multiplication, we see that a times b times x can be unambiguously defined. Either we can write this as first multiply two matrices a times b, then multiply this by an n-dimensional vector x, or we can first multiply an n by n matrix B times an n-dimensional vector X, and then multiply on the left by an n by n matrix A. Also, notice that if we multiply on the left by an n-dimensional identity matrix, which we'll denote by I sub n, then I sub n times X is equal to X for any n-dimensional vector X. So matrix multiplication is an example of a left group action. Here's another definition. Say that G is a group which acts on a non-empty set A. We define the stabilizer of each element lowercase a in our set capital A as the set capital G sub lowercase a. This is the set of elements lowercase g in our group capital G such that lowercase g circle lowercase a is equal to lowercase a. Here, recall that lowercase a is fixed and we're asking what are all of the elements lowercase g and capital G so that lowercase g circle a equals a. We'll define the kernel of the group action as the following set. The kernel of phi, phi recalls just the permutation representation, is the set of elements lowercase g such that sigma sub lowercase g is the trivial permutation. We can also write this by saying this is the collection of elements lowercase g in our set capital G, such that g circle a equals a for all elements a in our set capital A. It turns out that this is also equal to the intersections over all lowercase a of the stabilizers g sub lowercase a. Here's the main result putting all of this together. Again, say that we have a group which acts on a non nifty set capital A. For each element lowercase a in our set capital A, the stabilizer g sub a is a subgroup of capital G. Let's consider the relation tilde on our set A, which is defined by saying lowercase a is related to lowercase b if and only if b equals g times a for some element lowercase g in our set capital G. Then tilde defines an equivalence relation on the set capital A. Finally, the number of elements in this equivalence class, this equivalence class will denote by script O sub A, that is, it's the set of elements of the form G circle A, where lowercase g is in our group G, is the index of the stabilizer in our group. That is, the number of elements in the equivalence class, script O sub A, is the index of G sub A in the group capital G. Using this, here's a couple more definitions. Again, say that we have a group which acts on a non empty set capital A. This equivalence class, script O sub A, is called the orbit of our element A. 
we'll say that our group G is transitive on the set A if there is only one orbit. That is, given two elements A and B in our set capital A, there exists a G in our group capital G such that B equals G times A. Let's see some examples of this going back to linear algebra. Let's let G be GL2 of R. That is the group of invertible two by two matrices. And here, our operation circle will just be matrix multiplication. We see that we have now an action on the collection of non-zero two-dimensional vectors. Before, we were considering two-dimensional vectors. Now, let's just stay away from the origin. Just like before, we have an action of GL2R on this two-dimensional space by just multiplying on the left with our two by two matrices. You can see here, if we multiply two by two matrix, A11, A12, A21, A22, times a two-dimensional vector XY, then our definition gives us another two-dimensional vector. It'll have components A11X plus A12Y and A21X plus A22Y. However, the action of G here is not quite a faithful action. Remember that faithful means that if we consider now the action of G on A, then every element G should map to a unique element in A. This is not quite the case. For example, if we choose our element A to be the vector 1, 0, and if we choose any invertible matrix of the form 1, A12, 0, 1, you can check here that the determinant is not equal to 0, then G times A equals A. This means that there are a lot of matrices which stabilize the vector 1, 0. In particular, the stabilizer, G sub A, is an infinite subgroup of R group G, GL2 of R. However, the action of G on A has only one orbit. That means given any two vectors, A and B, in our set capital A, we can always find an invertible matrix G such that B equals G times A. Rather explicitly, here's how to do this. Say that we have two vectors, let's call them A1 and A2, as well as B1, B2. We can write down a matrix G, as you see here on your screen, rather explicitly, such that G times A equals the vector B. The idea here is that if you give us a vector A, we can travel to any other vector B by just multiplying by this matrix G. Of course, from what we've seen above, this matrix G is not unique. This simply says that there exists at least one vector, at least one matrix G, such that B equals G times A. So this means that G acts on A transitively. However, this action is not faithful. Here's another example involving the dihedral group. Remember that we've drawn out the dihedral group first by considering the regular n-gon. Here, we'll fix an integer n at least three, and let's consider the vertices p sub k that we can map out as the vertices of our regular n-gon. We've defined before d sub 2n as the group of rigid rotations of this n-gon, which are just generated by two rigid rotations. First, we have R, which is a rotation that sends P sub K to P sub K plus 1. And we have a reflection S, which sends P sub K to P sub 2 minus K, which is just a reflection about a certain line of the form Y equals MX. Let's actually consider what happens when this group D sub 2N acts on this collection of vertices. We'd like to consider a couple of subgroups of the dihedral group. First, let's consider the subgroup G, which is just a collection of rotations. Namely, let's consider G, which just takes a look at the various powers of our rotation R. Namely, G consists of the actions 1, R, R squared, all the way through R to the n minus 1. We'll actually see that G is an action that acts on A both faithfully and transitively. Let's see what this means. Pick a typical element G from the set capital G. Well, since the set capital G just consists of rotations, every rotation will just be a power of R. So let's write 
lowercase g as r to the m for some integer m. Similarly, let's pick a vertex on our regular n-gon. Let's denote this vertex lowercase a as p sub k. It's easy to check by induction that here we have an action g times a, which sends p sub k to p sub k plus m. Using this, we can now see that the stabilizer of our point a, namely g sub a, is just the trivial rotation. That is, the only way in which we're going to rotate a point p sub k and leave it alone is if the original rotation were just the identity rotation to begin with. Using this, we can consider the kernel of our permutation representation. Recall that it's just the intersection over all of the stabilizers g sub a. If each of the stabilizers g sub a is the trivial subgroup, then the kernel is also the trivial subgroup. However, recall that our g acts faithfully on a precisely when the kernel of this representation is the trivial subgroup. So we see now that g does indeed act faithfully on the set of vertices capital A. Finally, you can check that the orbit of our point A is just the entire set of vertices capital A. Indeed, if you were to start with any vertex p sub k, by simply rotating by this rotation r, you can eventually arrive to any other vertex in capital A. For example, if you start at p sub 1, you can always rotate the p sub 4 by just rotating three times, going to p sub 2, then p sub 3, then p sub 4, all multiplying by just r cubed. So there is only one orbit, which means that g acts transitively on the set of vertices, capital A. Let's consider another subgroup. Let's consider the subgroup that's generated by the reflections. Remember that s here is just a reflection about the line y equals mx. We claim that g acts faithfully on the set of vertices, but not transitively. Let's see a couple of reasons of why this is true. First, let's just consider the non-trivial reflection, lowercase g, from our group capital G. That is, let's pick lowercase g is just equal to s. Well, if we pick a vertex, lowercase a, which is p sub k, then we know that g times a goes to p sub 2 minus k. Now we need to ask the question, when do we have a stabilizer? That is, if we're simply going to act going from a to g times a, when is g times a equal to a? Well, g times a equals to a precisely when 2 minus k equals k. And you can see here that we have a couple of different cases, essentially depending upon k, and also depending upon whether n is even or odd. So our stabilizer, g sub a, consists of two elements, that is, it's the entire group G. If either K is equal to one, remember that P1 just goes to P1, or when K is equal to N over two plus one. That is, there are only two points, namely lowercase a, when we have the stabilizer consisting of the entire group. These are the so-called fixed points after we reflect. However, for any other point P sub K, the reflection would just map it over to its mirror image. So the stabilizer, g sub a, must be trivial in all other cases. Using this, if we consider now the intersection over all stabilizers, we see that the kernel of phi must be the trivial subgroup. This is, yet again, the reason why the action of g on the, vert on the vertices must be faithful. Now, we can consider the orbit of our action. Recall that we found before that the number of vertices in our orbit depends upon the index of the stabilizer in the entire group. Since we've already determined the size of the stabilizer in the previous proposition, we can put this together to see that we have an orbit of exactly one point if either k is equal to one or k is equal to n over two plus one. Otherwise, we have two elements in our orbit. Here's what this means. Say that a is equal to p sub 1, just the first vertex. Then if we reflect using s, we know that p sub 1 stays fixed after this reflection. This is what it means to say that there's only one point in the orbit, namely the point is p sub 1. Otherwise, for example, if we have a point p sub 2, then we know that this reflection will send p sub 2 over to p sub n. 
So p sub 2 and p sub n lie in the other orbit. There's just two vertices in this orbit. So this is why the number of elements would be 2 when a is equal to either p sub 2 or p sub n. So we see now that in these cases, because the number of elements in the orbit is either 1 or 2, that the orbit now cannot be all of the set of vertices A. There is no way that we could start at any vertex and arrive to any other vertex by reflection. But of course, this should make sense intuitively. Since script O sub A does not equal to the set of vertices capital A, our action of G by the reflections is not transitive. We want to present some other types of group actions. First, let's talk about what's called left multiplication on the cosets. Let's say that G is a group and let H be a subgroup of G, not necessarily a normal one. We want to consider the action of G on the left cosets, which we'll denote by capital A, which are denoted by G mod H, coming from left multiplication. What we mean is, say that we have a coset, namely lowercase a times h, and we multiply it by an element lowercase g from our group capital G. We define g times a times h as the coset g times a times h. This action of sending a times h to the coset g times a times h gives us what's called the permutation representation associated to g. That is, we have a group homomorphism, which we'll denote by pi sub h, which sends our group G to the set of permutations G sub a, which does the following. It sends an element lowercase g to that permutation sigma to lowercase g that says sends a coset a times h to the coset g times a times h. This is a transitive group action on the collection of left cosets, capital A. Indeed, if A times H and B times H are two left cosets, then let's let lowercase g just be the element B times A inverse. It's easy to see now that B times H is equal to the left coset G times A times H. This is why our group action only has one orbit. Here's the main proposition. Let G be a group and let H be a subgroup. Again, not necessarily normal. Let's denote the following set, K, which is the intersection over the conjugates A times H times A inverse, where lowercase a ranges over all of the elements in the group, capital G. Then K is the largest normal subgroup of G, which is contained in H. Here's the main result. Let G be a group and assume that G is a finite group of order n. First, G is isomorphic to a subgroup of a symmetric group S sub n. Second, if P is the smallest prime dividing this order n, then any subgroup H of index P must be normal in the group G. We want to discuss some other types of group actions, those that we'll call conjugation. Let G be a group and let P of G denote the power set of G. This is the collection of all subsets of G. Now let's say that A is indeed a subset of G. That is, it's an element of the power set of G. Then the centralizer of A is a subgroup of the normalizer of A, which in turn is a subgroup of G. Here's a proof. We know that the normalizer of A is a subset of G. Let's say, for example, that G A G inverse equals A for all lowercase a in our set capital A. If this is true for some element lowercase g, then G circle A circle G inverse equals A for the same element G. And so this actually shows that the centralizer of A is contained in the normalizer of A. Now it suffices to show that both the centralizer and the normalizer are groups. Notice first that the identity commutes with any element lowercase a and capital G. So lowercase e times lowercase a equals lowercase a times lowercase e. This implies that the identity e 
is an element of the centralizer of A and an element of the normalizer of A. Hence, the centralizer and normalizer are both non-empty subsets of our group G. Now, let's consider the following map, which we'll denote by a dot. This is not a circle, it will be a dot. It will take a pair consisting of an element lowercase g from our set G and a subset capital A from the power set of G and return G circle A circle G inverse. This we will denote simply put by G dot A. We claim, first of all, that we have a group action of G on the power set of G. Indeed, take any two elements from the group G sub 1 and G sub 2 from our group capital G. We will verify that G1 dot parentheses G2 dot A is equal to parentheses G1 circle G2 dot A. Let's try to wind through some of these definitions. First, let's consider G1 dot G2 dot A. Unwinding these, recall that G2 dot A is G2 circle A, circle G2 inverse, and G1 dot that quantity is equal to G1 circle, that quantity, circle G1 inverse. Combining all of this together and recalling some identities that we found about the inverse of G1 circle G2, we now say that this is equal to G1 circle G2 circle A, circle inverse of G1 circle G2. But staring at this, this is the same thing as parentheses G1 circle G2 dot A. Similarly, we can also check that E dot A is just equal to our set, our subset, capital A. So we do indeed have a group action of the group G on the power set of G. Using this, let's now reinterpret the normalizer and the centralizer in terms of this group action. Notice that the normalizer of A consists of all of those elements, lowercase g and capital G, such that G dot capital A equals capital A. Hence, for all X and Y in the normalizer, we have the following. Let's consider X circle Y inverse dot A. We can express this, since we have a group action, as X dot parentheses Y inverse dot A. However, y is an element of the normalizer, so y inverse dot a is just equal to a. Similarly, x is in the normalizer, so x dot a is equal to a. This means that x circle y inverse must also be in the normalizer. But using the subgroup criterion, this then now implies that the normalizer is a group. Let's consider a similar property, but for the centralizer. Let's fix an element, lowercase a, in our subgroup, in our subset, capital A, and let's consider now the singleton subset, which just consists of one element, namely that lowercase a. Then the centralizer of A consists of those elements, lowercase g, in our group, capital G, such that lowercase g dot the singleton set, consisting of lowercase a, is equal to the singleton set, consisting of just lowercase a. And this is true for all lowercase a in our subset, capital A. Just like before, for any x and y in the centralizer, we can consider x circle y inverse dot the singleton set consisting of just the element lowercase a. Pretty much following the same argument as before, we see that x circle y inverse must also be in the centralizer, implying that the centralizer is also a group. Let's just make a quick observation we're going to come back to in just a moment. Notice that the way that we've set up all of this is that we see now that the normalizer is actually the stabilizer of our action on the set capital A, and the centralizer is just the kernel of this group action. We'll come back in just a moment to these concepts. Now, stepping back, let's say that G is a group. We want to consider the action of G on the entire power set. Now, capital A is equal to the set of all subsets of G via conjugation. 
That is the map dot will be just like before. Here, we'll say that G dot any subset capital S, recall it's just defined as G circle capital S, circle G inverse. Using this, recall that the stabilizer of a subset capital S is just the normalizer of S and G. That is the stabilizer under this action, G sub capital S, is the set of elements lowercase g such that lowercase g dot S equals S. But now recalling the definition we've given now of dot, we see that this set is equal to the set of all lowercase g such that G circle S, circle G inverse, is equal to S. But this set, by definition, is just the normalizer of S and G. So the stabilizer of a subset S is exactly the same as the normalizer of S under this operation of conjugation. Since conjugation is a group action, we can now define a relation on two subsets, S and T, of our group G, by saying that S is related to T if capital T equals G circle S circle G inverse for some element G in our group capital G. This defines an equivalence relation on capital A, namely the power set of G. Here's a definition. We consider an action by group G on the power set of G by conjugation. That is, we have a map dot which takes an element lowercase g and a subset S to G dot S, which is G circle S circle G inverse. Let's define the conjugacy class of capital S as the orbit O sub S, which consists of all subsets of the form G circle S circle G inverse as we range over lowercase g in our group capital G. As a corollary, the number of conjugates S is the index of the normalizer of S in our group G. Recall here that S is any subset of the group capital G. Here's a rather famous proposition that's a main result from group theory. Let G be a finite group. Then there exists elements A1, A2, through A sub R, which are not in the center of G, such that the size of the group G is equal to the size of the center of G plus a series of indices. Namely, we sum, i going from 1 to r, of the index of the centralizer of a sub i in the group G. This expression here is called the class equation. Let's give one more example before we call it a day. Recall that the 2 by 2 general linear group is just a set of 2 by 2 matrices, let's denote them as A, B, C, D, whose determinant, AD minus BC, does not equal to 0. Recall that we just denote this by GL2. In this case, we'll work having our coefficients, A, B, C, D, as complex numbers. We have an action of the group GL2C on the extended complex plane which we denote by P1 of C as follows. P1 of C is just simply the complex numbers, but we're going to add in one more point, which we'll denote as the point at infinity. Let's define a map, in this case using circle, by taking a matrix capital A and a complex number Z and stating the circle sends this pair to the extended complex number AZ plus B divided by CZ plus D. Notice that perhaps if z equals to negative d over c, then this quantity, a circle z, would just be infinity. This is a group action. That is, given two invertible matrices, capital A and capital B, then parentheses a times b, circle z, is equal to a circle, parentheses, b circle z. Moreover, if we let I sub 2 be the 2 by 2 identity matrix, then I sub 2 circle Z is equal to Z for all extended complex numbers Z. As a remark, these maps Z goes to AZ plus B over CZ plus D are called Mobius transformations. 
Here's a corollary to this result. Consider now the special linear group as a subgroup of GL2C. Recall that the special linear group is just a collection of two by two matrices whose determinant is equal to one. Now, we're going to only focus on the cases where the coefficients, namely lowercase a, b, c, and d, are real numbers, not to complex numbers. Let's denote H2 as the collection of complex numbers whose imaginary part y is greater than zero. This we will call the upper half plane, which is just a subset of our extended complex plane. First, if w is an extended complex number of the form az plus b divided by cz plus d, then the imaginary part of w is just equal to the imaginary part of z divided by the square of the absolute value of the complex number cz plus d. This is greater than or equal to zero whenever the imaginary part of z is greater than zero. Second, if we just restrict having an action instead of from GL2 acting on the extended complex plane, P1, now we have an action of SL2R to the upper half plane, H2, then this now is a well-defined group action. We'll come back and discuss this a bit more throughout the summer. But for now, thanks for watching.